Welcome to Let's Talk number 21. Today we're going to be looking at building a digital workflow using DxO's Photo Lab 4. We've been using Optics Pro and other DxO products uh, since version 3.75 of Optics Pro. Uh, we've been using Viewpoint and Film Pack since versions 1. In our estimate, there isn't another product on the market that can equal what you can do with DxO, specifically when it comes to raw images. So let's talk about some of the things that we've seen over the years. We've been doing seminars and workshops, both for groups and individual photographers, for over a decade now. And it's pretty clear that the major problem we keep seeing is a lack of consistency your consistent processing of images is a key to building a recognizable style. And in a world where everyone's work looks the same, learning how to stand out is critical to your success. Many of the photographers we've worked with have no rhyme or reason. They use an ad hoc method of trying to fix their images or optimizing their images and ultimately they may succeed, but they will not produce a recognizable, consistent image style. We use a top-down method, which you're going to see momentarily, which has helped us develop consistency and a uniform look and feel across all of our work. A key to that will be using presets in a subsequent version of uh, Let's Talk. We'll be talking about specifically how and why and when to create presets. But for the moment, let's take a look at Photo Lab 4. As you can see, I've opened Photo Lab 4. This is from a shoot from last fall, um, a kind of antique automobile graveyard. This image was created with the Pentax 645Z 50 megapixel medium format camera using an approximately 60 year old vintage lens. It was late in the afternoon. It had rained. There was a lot of mist and a lot of water in the air. By default, the first time that you open PhotoLab 4, uh, your workspace is in standard mode, which means that there are fewer options for you to work with. It's a more streamlined, less complex view. Uh, note the blue marks that or switches that indicate that a feature has been turned on. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to enable the advanced workspace. Okay, you can see there has been an adjustment made um, to all my options here. The next step in our workflow is to apply a preset. A preset is a collection of settings intended to create a specific look and feel or to adjust specific technical problems. Uh, here, if we look at one of the images that's been done, I'm looking for a warmer look I'm looking for um, a lot of detail that I've otherwise lost. You'll see the image here momentarily. Um, this image may end up black and white, so I made it a bit more dramatic. You can see the before and the after. But let's go back here. In case you're wondering, we do intentionally underexpose. Um, that is a consequence of the vintage lenses um, and also the light meter in the 645Z. Remember that in the digital world, you can always get detail out of the shadows. An area that's blown out is unretrievable. So the first thing I'm going to do is look for a preset. I'm going to use one of my afternoon light presets, and you can see we have an entire collection 
of a variety of look looks and feels. Uh, but for the sake of what I want to accomplish here, I'm going to go with the one specifically designed for the Pentax. Okay, you can see that immediately uh, most of the technical problems are gone. I'm going to begin the way that we've developed our methodology, which is starting with color, then to light, then to detail. If I wanted to make any local adjustments um, or watermarking, they would be done last. So let's start out with color. I typically don't change the color temperature unless there's a compelling reason to do so. If, for example, I needed to counter a specific shift to yellow or to blue or a late afternoon uh, photograph where the color temperature would be completely off, I would change it. But typically, I leave it as it is. Accentuation, I like a little bit of pop with vibrancy. So I will pick up the vibrancy and the saturation a little bit. And by the way, uh, notice our curve. I mean, our histogram has moved more towards the center. If I reset the image temporarily, you can see that the histogram is to the dark side. So let's go ahead and put our preset back. Okay, I don't push saturation or vibrancy too far. It will flatten the histogram, which means there will be some loss of detail. Um, color rendering. We've been using film pack since version one. In fact, we were part of the beta for the original film pack. We absolutely love it. Um, the ability to completely change the emotional experience of an image is unsurpassed. It's the cornerstone of everything that we do. Um, by the way, notice that the intensity is set to 100%. And I have the intensity of protected shot, protected I'm sorry, protect saturated color set to 31. For this preset in particular, I have pulled up overall the saturation to 56%. I will check luminosity and uniformity later. Um, but for the most part, I'm going to leave that exactly where it is in this preset. I really like it and it's one that we typically um, will use. So after color, my next stop is lighting. Here is a question of how you want to recover detail in the shadows. We typically use a combination of exposure compensation and smart lighting. We prefer smart lighting because it's less destructive and that's not a DxO problem. It's a consequence of how exposure works um, to adjusting the exposure. So an option I have, for example, would be to take the exposure now and increase my smart lighting. The effect will be about the same. Selective toning is something that we use a lot. In this case, notice that my highlights are set to zero. I'm going to darken them. That will overall help me recover the area at the top of the van. My midtones are lightened, my shadows are lightened, and if I wanted, and this will help me pick up the detail here, I pull my black up, and now you can see I've got detail on that tire. I can add drama back by using Clearview Plus. Clearview, in effect, adds a kind of black to the image. It's an advanced kind of contrast 
that we find works really well. Typically, before I adjust my contrast, I will go to my tone curve. Again, I prefer to move top down from the most general to the most specific. And in this case, in the tone curve, you can see I lowered the highlights, I boosted the blacks. I have the ability to adjust individual colors, which I have not done here. You can see the straight green line. And finally, contrast. I am not a fan of contrast. It adds a lot of black that can lose detail. Micro contrast is not as bad, but I am going to lower this a little bit to about six. And under advanced, I am going to pick up the contrast, the fine contrast in the lit areas that should counterbalance my highlights. So if we now compare before and after, we're good to go. At this point, the last area of the image I'm going to look at will be detail. Prime and deep prime are absolutely phenomenal. And as much as typical denoising has added substantially um, to the quality of the image and has been very much improved over the last five years. Deep Prime is a step beyond. Um, we use it extensively. Do keep in mind that you need to rely on the preview window to get a sense for how it is denoising. But you can see the image is reasonably clearer. I say reasonably only because you can't really see it unless you either look in the preview or expand this to 100%. <coughs> I have the ability also to remove dead pixels, to adjust chromatic aberration, which I typically leave at 100, and my size at 9. I do often add purple fringing removal. Moiré is good. It depends upon the image. In some images, moiré is more of a problem than in others. I'm going to turn it on here. And the intensity went to 100%. I'm going to leave it there. U-sharp mask, mask is a great way to add additional detail. Um, do so sparingly. Um, we prefer a threshold of around 0.5 and a threshold of 4. Um, sometimes it's nice to increase it a little bit for some additional sharpness. And you can offset the edge. I will not do that here. So at this point, I'm ready to export this image. Again, the before and the after, if we want to look at it side by side. That will give you a sense of the improvement that we've been able to achieve. I urge you to begin to collect presets. It's a very simple process. Before you export the image, on Windows right click and choose Create um, Preset from the current settings. And all you will have to do is enter a name that will help you remember. When you export, by the way, I strongly recommend that you export to a TIFF. Um, if you're going to use the image for multi-purposes, because the JPEG loses about 80% of the detail you're going to see. So that's about it for our Let's Talk 21 top-down look at DxO Photo Lab 4. We'll be back in a day or two to talk about some of the specifics and how and when to use them. On behalf of the House of Night Falcon, my name is Falcon. I thank you for listening today, and uh, my contact information is at the end of this video. Take care. If you want to contact us, we can be reached at nightfalcon.com or our magazine site, nightvision.com. And if you want to email me directly, you can reach me at inspiration at nightfalcon.com.